he is very, very sorry. <laughs> Lydia was born in March, and uh, I apparently forgot to include that. In the 16th chapter of Job, beginning in verse 18, Job states, O earth, do not cover my blood, and let my cry have no resting place. Surely even now my witness is in heaven and my evidence is on high. My friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Oh, that a man, or oh, that one would plead for a man with God. As a man pleads for his neighbor. For when a few years are finished, I shall go the way of no return. Job makes this statement in what is typically referred to as the second cycle of speeches. He's here suffering. He's lost his children. He saw his wife's faith falter. He's, he's lost his status amongst the people. He's lost his health and his suffering with boils from head to toe. And he's lost as well the respect of his friends and even the kindness of his friends. And throughout the first cycle of speeches, which encompassed chapter 12 through chapter 14, Job has time and time again argued for his innocence, argued that, that he's not done anything worth the suffering that he's enduring. But his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, have very clearly indicated that he is a great sinner. Job, you're suffering so greatly. You must have sinned greatly as well. And so Job responds to them, arguing for his innocence, arguing that he's done nothing worthy of the suffering that he's enduring. And part of his argument, especially in chapter 12 and chapter 13, is that sometimes the righteous suffer and sometimes the wicked prosper. The very opposite of what it appeared to them to be. It appeared, especially to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, that the, the righteous always prosper and the wicked always suffer. But Job says, no, that's not the case. Sometimes the righteous suffer too. And here in chapter 16 through chapter 17, Job is responding to what Eliphaz has had to say in chapter 15, primarily that Job is wrong. Job is wrong about the suffering of the righteous. The, the righteous do not suffer. The wicked suffer. The righteous prosper. And so in chapter 16, Job is making a response to Eliphaz. In the first five verses of chapter 16, he rebukes his friends for how they've been treating him and for what they've been saying to him. Beginning and then in verse 6 through verse 16 of chapter 16, he details some of the things that God has done to him, some of the things that God has caused to befall him and the suffering he's endured. And then finally in verse 17, he once again affirms his innocence. He says, although no violence is in my hands and my prayer is pure. Following that assertion of innocence, once again, we find our section for our study this morning. In verse 18, Job calls upon the earth not to cover his blood. O oh, earth, do not cover my blood and let my cry have no resting place. In the Old Testament... The blood of the murdered cried out to God for vengeance. And apparently what Job is stating in verse 18 is that he indeed is going to die, but not just that he's going to die, but that he's basically going to be murdered. That he's going to be unjustly put to death because he's innocent of all wrong. He does not deserve death. And so he states, O earth, do not cover my blood, arguing I'm being put to death. I'm being, I'm being murdered. And my blood needs to cry out for vengeance. It needs to cry out for justice. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, after Cain 
killed Abel, God told Cain that Abel's blood cries out from the ground. Later in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 24 and verse 7 through 8, the blood of the innocent cried out for justice against Jerusalem. Job wants his blood to cry out. Do not cover my blood, O earth. Allow it to cry out for justice. Innocent blood, you see, could only be avenged. It could only be justified in one of two ways. Either the murderer... Was to, had to be put to death, was to be executed, or in the case where the people didn't know what or who had killed the individual, sometimes that happens, sometimes somebody will be murdered and nobody knows. In such a case, Moses set forth steps that they were to follow in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 1 through 9. They had to go take a heifer and go down to a valley with running water in it. And once the elders of the city took that heifer and went down to the valley with the water running through it, they broke the heifer's neck and then they washed their hands over top of the heifer and declared that they didn't have any idea, that they didn't know who it was that had murdered this individual. And what happened then was that the blood of the murdered cried out. Vengeance was placed, justice was placed in God's hands. For him to mete out justice against the one who had committed the crime. Here, Job calls upon the earth not to cover his blood because he's stating or implying that he is being murdered. He's being unjustly put to death. And so in verse 18, he calls upon the earth not to cover his blood. In verse 19, he then expresses a confidence. He's confident that yes, indeed, he is about to die, that he's being murdered, but he's also confident as well that he has a witness who will argue his case. In verse 19, he says, Surely even now my witness is in heaven. The term witness is very important in the Old Testament. Witness often, the term witness often occurs in legal and judicial uh, texts, in judicial contexts. For instance, in Jeremiah chapter 32, Jeremiah purchased a field in the presence of witnesses. In Ruth chapter 4, Boaz acquired the estate of Elimelech and Naomi in the presence of witnesses. And what we need to understand there is that is a legal transaction, a judicial act that's going on there. Much like we would buy land and fill out a new land title. And the title would be handed over to us. They would transact these legal matters in the presence of witnesses. Not only does witness occur in that sense, but of course the law forbade false witness. And at least two or three witnesses were required for capital punishment. Along with that, lesser crimes also required multiple witnesses. The point is that a witness would be there to verify the truth, to verify that something or what occurred and the factuality of the matter. Here, Job is arguing he has a witness. He has someone in heaven or something in heaven that will argue the facts of the case, that will present the truthfulness primarily of his innocence, And as well of his unjust suffering and his unjust murder when it comes to that. As well, in the Bible, various things were used as witnesses. People, of course, functioned as witnesses, as we saw in Jeremiah and also in the book of Ruth. But inanimate objects as well. Stone heaps were witnesses. The law itself was witness. Even an altar and song sometimes functioned as witnesses. Isaiah the prophet foretold of the time in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 4 when God would bring forth his servant David as witness. Someone who would testify to the facts, testify to the truth. Of course in the New Testament, Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 is the faithful witness. And throughout the Bible, God above all is witness. He testifies to the truth. 
He testifies to the facts. He does not lie and he is honest and faithful in all things. With God, sometimes the term witness denotes what happens because of his witness. That is, God is truthful, God is honest, and therefore when he witnesses acts that are unjust, that are unrighteous, or when he witnesses acts that are not faithfully kept as in vows or oaths, his witness ensues in judgment and punishment. But God is the perfect witness. God is honest. God is faithful. God is just. God is righteous. And added to that, He's all-knowing. And He's always present. And when we think about human trials, we think about juries and judges, we want a good witness. If we're innocent, if we've not committed a crime, we want a good witness that can verify the facts. And if, on the other hand, we're the prosecution and we're trying to convict someone, we want a good witness to witness to the facts. Sometimes in trials, legal trials, you'll have a witness brought to a stand and either the prosecution or the defense, whichever the witness testifies basically against, they will try to attack the credibility of the witness. Show how they're unfaithful in some way. Show perhaps how they've lied. But of course God never lies. God is always faithful. God is always just. He is the perfect witness. And so here in Job chapter 16 and verse 19, Job states, surely even now my witness is in heaven, but also he states, and my evidence is on high. Evidence here stands parallel to witness. In Hebrew poetry, the the poets would use what's called parallelism. They would use parallelism to expand or to clarify the idea presented in the first line. So here, witness and evidence stand parallel to one another. Helping clarify, helping understand a little bit more about what Job is stating. Perhaps, though, the most important aspect of verse 19 is the location of the witness. Again, he states in verse 19, Surely even now my witness is in heaven and my evidence is on high. Job has a witness, but his witness isn't on earth. His evidence isn't on earth. It's in heaven. At the very least, what Job is stating here, at the very least, his witness is in the very presence of God. Now we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about who his witness is or what his witness might be. But at the very least, what he's stating is that it's in the very presence of God. It's in heaven. Job is confident. He has a witness. So Job makes a call in verse 18. In verse 19, he expresses a confidence. And finally, in verse 20 through 22, he expresses a cry. He has a great desire. Oh, that one would plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. Job greatly desires what we might call a mediator. In chapter 9, in verse 32 and verse 33, he states, For he is not a man, speaking of God, as I am, that I may answer him and that we should go to court together, nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Job wants someone who can speak on his behalf to God. Interesting thing about what Job does in the book is he progresses further and further in his affirmation of innocence to the point where he says, God, come speak to me. I'm not going to say any more until you come speak to me. He wants to stand before God. Interesting thing is when it happens, he doesn't have too much to say other than I abhor myself and I cover my mouth. I've uttered what I do not understand. But Job wants someone. In the beginning of the book, he recognized the fact that he could not stand before God. Who am I that I'm going to be able to go before the Almighty and declare my innocence and argue my case? For I'm not like him. Job needs somebody. He wants somebody. He desires somebody. He cries out for somebody to argue his case on his behalf. To argue with God for him. 
as a man would plead for his neighbor. His friends didn't do that. Instead, he says in, in this text, my friends scorned me. They mocked him. They made fun of him. They made light of his suffering and stated that it was his wickedness, his sin that had caused his great suffering. As well, not only did his friends scorn him, he says, my eyes poured out tears to God. And in this context, he's probably suggesting, I've, I've cried out to God. I, I've poured out my tears to God. And he just won't answer. Why won't he answer? Why won't he respond? I just want him to respond. And so Job wants a mediator. He wants someone to plead on his behalf. In this context, to plead, again, has the, the judicial, legal kind of aspect to it. The pleading that might occur in a courtroom. Job wants someone to plead or to mediate or to argue his case. Primarily because he sees his life about to end. In verse 22, he states, For when a few years are finished, I shall go the way of no return. The phrase in the first line there, a few years are finished, appears to be an idiomatic phrase, according to Kyle and to Leach. It doesn't suggest that he's going to live a few years. Rather, what it suggests is the brevity of his life. He doesn't think he's going to live very much longer. In fact, he's going to go the way of no return. And then in the very next verse, in chapter 17, verse 1, he says, my spirit is broken, my days are extinguished, the grave is ready for me. Job sees his life about to end. And that has driven him to cry out for a mediator. To cry out for someone who would plead his case. Job believes that he's suffering unjustly. That he's innocent. And that his witness is in heaven. Who then, or what then, is Job's witness? Who or what has Job placed his confidence in? There have been at least two broad suggestions in the various commentaries you might read as to who Job is referring to here as his witness. The two broad suggestions are either that Job's witness is something impersonal or, in the contrast, we might say something personal. As far as impersonal suggestions, uh, something like perhaps his blood, as we see in verse 18. Oh, earth, do not cover up my blood. And so perhaps he is seeing his witness as his blood that would cry out for vengeance, some might suggest. Another impersonal suggestion has been Job's affirmation of innocence. On the personal side, we might note that suggestions are perhaps God or maybe even uh, Jesus. It seems to me that the personal aspect, at least, must be some sort of divine being. Because Job has stated very succinctly in verse 18 that his witness is in heaven, or verse 19, excuse me, and that his evidence is on high. And so it doesn't seem to me that if we're going to look at the personal aspect, that it can be a human. Rather, it has to be someone in heaven to argue his case. As far as the two broad possibilities are concerned, impersonal or personal, David Kleins in the Word Biblical Commentary series, in the commentary on Job, argues that Job's witness in heaven is his own, quote, protestation of innocence and his formal deposition that requires God to give an account of himself, his affirmation of innocence or his legal cry. What he's stating is Job in verse 17 and prior to this and then later as well when we get around chapter 31, Job affirms his innocence. He takes a vow of innocence and says that I am innocent. I've done nothing worthy of this suffering. That that perhaps is the witness that is in heaven before God. Klein suggests a couple reasons not to think that it is God himself that is Job's witness. He says God could not be Job's witness because God is Job's murderer. And to set God up as Job's murderer and his witness would be paradoxical. God is the one who has crushed Job. In fact, Job has stated so much 
in this chapter, in chapter 16. In verse 6, if you go back up, he says, Though I speak, my grief is not relieved, and if I remain silent, how am I eased? But now he, speaking of God, he has worn me out. You have made desolate all my company. You have shriveled me up, and it is a witness against me. My leanness rises up against me and bears witness to my face. He tears me in his wrath and hates me. He gnashes at me with his teeth. My adversary sharpens his gaze on me. He's saying God is indeed the one who has crushed him. Job as well desires a mediator between God and himself, and perhaps that would suggest that God isn't viewed as the witness either. But while Klein's view is possible, I think there are some major problems with it that point in another direction. First of all, Paradoxical doesn't mean impossible. Something that is paradoxical, of course, is something that appears contradictory. And indeed, there is a sense in which Job's view of God does evidence some view of contradiction. He does view God as his redeemer, as his savior, but on the other hand, he as well views God as the one who has crushed him. Even in the beginning of the book, in Job chapter 1 and verse 21, he stated, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the Lord. The Lord's the one that blessed me. He's the one that gave it to me, but he's also the one that took it away. Later in chapter 2 and verse 10, as his wife encouraged him to curse God and die, he stated, shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? God is the one who has blessed me. God is the one who has given me good, but he's also the one that has taken it away. And then in Job chapter 13 and verse 15, he makes one of the most amazing statements of the book. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job indeed sees God as the one who is crushing him, but he also sees God as the one who is able to save him. Job's life indeed was filled with paradox. God is the one who he sees as causing the suffering, but also the one that he can plead to. But you know, is that really any different from any sufferer? At least any sufferer that has a Bible background and who knows God. For the sufferer, even today, he may look at the Bible and the Bible's description of God and he knows that God is all-knowing, that God is all-good, and that God is ever-present, and that God is all-powerful. And he looks at God's description in the Bible and he says, why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God take this away? Why is he doing this to me? See, that's a paradox. I know God has the ability. I know God has the power. And so why is this happening to me? And in fact, that's the paradox that Job is living in. The view that God is both witness and adversary, although it might be paradoxical, is very much not beyond the scope of Job. In fact, it fits in very much. Walter Zorn noted on this text, he said, God is the one who wants to accuse or who he wants to accuse. And yet he must appeal to God alone. John Hartley, in his commentary on Job, explained further. He said, for a moment, Job sees God as his steadfast supporter. In this plea, he is expressing the trust God had expressed in him in the prologue because he is pushing through the screens of his troubles to the real God. He is not essentially pitting God against God. Rather, he is affirming genuine confidence in God, regardless of the way it appears that God is treating him. And so while it may be the case that it would be paradoxical to have God as adversary and advocate, such fits in with the nature of the book of Job. Along with that, there's a second problem with Klein's view in an impersonal kind of witness. And that is that there is a time element involved in verse 19. In verse 19, Job states, surely even now. Job's full vow of innocence, his full affirmation of innocence, was not complete quite yet at this period of time. His full vow of innocence included as well his unjust death or his murder as he's described in verse 18. Yet that has not completely occurred yet. But Job can say with confidence that his witness is even now in heaven. It's already there. 
Thus, part of his complaint against God had not yet occurred if we're talking about simply a vow of innocence. Third, Job doesn't just want some type of impersonal witness. Job wants a personal witness. Oh, that one would plead for a man with God as a man pleads with his neighbor. He wants a person. He wants an individual to argue his case with God. It appears then, at least to me, that Job's heavenly witness, the heavenly witness that he wants, is not a something, but rather it is a someone. He wants someone to argue his case. Someone to stand for him. Someone to stand before God. In contrast to Klein's then, many commentators indeed believe that God is Job's witness. Just a few. Brown, Driver, and Briggs in their Hebrew lexicon. Homer Haley in his commentary on Job. John Hartley in his commentary that we've mentioned already. Kyle and DeLeach in their commentary. They all argue that Job's witness here is God. And indeed, as we've seen before, God is the perfect witness. His omniscience and His omnipresence make Him the perfect witness for man. I'm reminded of what the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to Him to whom we must give an account. But you know, when we look at verse 19, and we look at Job's statement that surely even now my witness is in heaven, Surely, from our Christian perspective, we might ask, could it be that Job is speaking of Christ? Homer Haley, again in his commentary, didn't believe such was the case. He stated earlier, Job lamented the fact that there was no umpire between himself and God, chapter 9 and verse 33. But he does have a witness in heaven who knows the facts of his life, and later he knew that his Redeemer lives. Are the witness and the Redeemer's two parties are one? It is best, he says, to interpret in light of the context above and accept God as the witness and Redeemer rather than God and another. Perhaps the context as well would agree with Haley. God indeed is Job's witness. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, he knows Job is blameless. He knows Job is righteous. He knows that Job has held to his integrity. And then at the end of the book, in chapter 42, he knows that Job has spoken things or darkened counsel. And so God indeed is witness. And so perhaps God here is Job's witness. Nevertheless, though, from our Christian perspective, I think whether or not Job had Jesus in mind, he expresses for us a desire for a mediator, a witness. And he expresses an innate human need for a heavenly witness that finds ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And not just in Jesus, but it finds ultimate fulfillment in Jesus and in Jesus alone. The New Testament writers, of course, argue time and time again that Jesus is our mediator. He is the one who stands for us before God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, He makes intercession on our behalf. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, He is our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul says, For there is one mediator, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. G. Campbell Morgan wrote concerning 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, The argument of the writer is that there is now one who is God in his own nature, and yet is actually man, who stands in the presence of God knowing perfectly, and he does so on our behalf. He stands before God vindicating the sinner. He has become the witness. Christ has entered in and there is our witness, our recorder. He is the one who perfectly knows and therefore is able prevailingly to mediate. 
He continued a few pages later on page 62. In him, that is in Christ, therefore we find the complete fulfillment of what dawned upon Job in the midst of the darkness. As the shining hope and confidence. The one who ever lives came into our earthly life. Stood upon the dust for us and argued our case on the earth level. By that unveiling we are brought to an understanding how he forever represents us. And argues our case in the high courts of heaven. Jesus is our witness. While Job desired and longed for a witness and a mediator, and he searched diligently and passionately for a witness, we as Christians today stand in the fuller revelation of the New Testament. We stand in the revelation that Jesus is our witness in heaven. We might ask then, how? How is Jesus our witness? In what ways does he function as our witness? There are a number, I think, and perhaps you can come up with more. But there are a number, I think, that are of worthy note, especially in connection with Job 16. First of all, Jesus, and really God as well, when we consider both of them divine, but Jesus is our witness in our sinfulness or our sinlessness. The ever-present eye of God sees all that we do. He sees our sin. He sees our righteousness. He sees the just actions and the unjust actions. He sees all that we do. He sees our sin. He sees our righteousness. God knew Job's character. Job was indeed innocent. And the important thing is that God knew it. God was witness. God knew that he was innocent. And Jesus knows the same about us. He knows whether we're sinful or we're sinless. God knows our good character. With Job, God knew in Job chapter 1 and verse 8 that there was none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who feared God and shunned evil. But you know at the end of the book as well, he knew that Job had darkened counsel by his words without knowledge. He knew the sin of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And Jesus knows his witness. He knows our sin or our sinlessness. As well, Jesus also knows our sorrow. In verse 20 of our text, Job laments, it appears, My friends scorn me, and my eyes pour out tears to God. It appears that he laments the fact that God has not answered to this point. But you know what? Just because God had not answered didn't mean that he didn't know about Job's tears. In fact, God was witness. And so too is Jesus, witness in our sorrow. God knew Job's sorrow and he was concerned. We sing the song sometimes, does Jesus care? And what the Bible tells us is that indeed he does. He even sympathizes with our weaknesses, Hebrew 4 and verse 15. Jesus witnesses our sorrow. He witnesses our sinfulness or our sinlessness. He witnesses our sorrow. And he witnesses at the same time our scorn. Again, Job lamented, my friends, scorn me. You know, I suppose it's one thing to suffer. It's one thing to endure ailment. It's one thing to endure the loss of your family. It's one thing to see your wife's faith falter. But then to have somebody come along who claims to be your friend and agitate it even more, how terrible that must be. His friends scorned him. But Jesus and God are our witnesses in scorn. Rather than help, Job's friends had hurt. They were miserable comforters. They were forgers of lies. They were worthless physicians. But you know, there's a friend That never fails. Even when others scorn us and fail us as they all will. Jesus will not. Jesus is our witness in scorn. Jesus as well is our witness in silence. Perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of suffering is what appears to be the silence from God. We pray to God to take away the suffering. We pray to God to help us. And of course... We know that he answers, but we know as well that sometimes 
The answer isn't exactly what we want. And that quietness, what appears to be God's quietness, his silence, can hurt as much as anything else. Job was dealing with that silence. Why doesn't he answer me? Why doesn't he just come tell me why this is occurring? There's a good book to read written by Philip Yancey entitled, Where's God When It Hurts? Where is God when it hurts? What Job reveals to us is that God is witness even in silence. The great apologist C.S. Lewis summarized his own suffering and probably Job's thoughts as well. After his wife had passed away, he wrote, Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing Him. So happy that you are tempted to feel His claims upon you as an interruption. If you remember yourself and turn to Him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with, well, with open arms. But go to Him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face. And a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You might as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in our time of trouble? Why does it appear that God is silent? What Job reveals to us here is that indeed there is a witness. A witness in our silence. Jesus is our witness, even when it appears that he's far away. Jesus is also our witness in suffering. Of course, that's what we're dealing with here in chapter 16. Job is suffering, and he's suffering greatly. And throughout Job's entire experience, the death of his children, the loss of his possessions, the loss of his status in the community, the loss of his health, the loss of basically everything that he had, Who was there? God was. And Jesus will be with us as well. Unbeknownst to Job, God walked through the valley of the shadow of death with him. God was there at his side. And Jesus will walk with us as well. Jesus, more than any other, has witnessed our human plight. He has taken on our form. He has lived as a man. And he knows what it is to be a man. And he witnesses and cares for us in suffering. You know, when I look at chapter 16 here in these verses, I see the great anguish that Job is in. And part of that anguish compels me to wish that I could reach back through the ages of time, place my hand on Job's shoulder, and speak to him and say, Job... Our witness is in heaven. There there is a witness. And not only is he our witness in heaven, but he's our witness in heaven. And and he was like us. He was man. Oh, that one would plead for a man with God. Indeed, we have one that will. Our witness is in heaven. And he became like us. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Not only that, Not only is our witness in heaven the one who became flesh, but he is the one as well who is God himself. John 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Philippians 2 and verse 6, He was in the form of God and did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. He is both God and man. Our witness in heaven, Job. We have a witness. And He's God and He's man. And He can argue our case before God and stand there as our perfect witness and our perfect mediator. And Job, His name is Jesus. Jesus. 